Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. We begin with an update on the death of former Premier Li Keqiang, who just stepped down in March and who died suddenly last week, officially of a heart attack. As we discussed last Friday, Li was viewed as a relatively more liberal reformer, in the economic field at least, in contrast to the general secretary he worked under, Xi Jinping. It appears that Li was quite popular among the general population, with waves of sadness and condolences sweeping over China's social media following the announcement of his death. Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post reports that members of the public gathered in cities with ties to Li Keqiang to pay tribute to the former premier over the weekend, laying masses of yellow and white flowers at landmarks associated with his life. For example, in Hefei, Aohei province, where Li was born and spent his early years, the outlet writes, people streamed in to lay flowers near Li's childhood home from Friday. On Saturday, hundreds of thousands of flowers with cards covered in excerpts of Li's speeches and personal notes surrounded the residential compound of his childhood home. Quote, There has been an outpouring of tributes and sorrow for former Premier Li Keqiang, some in the physical world at places connected to his life and a lot online. It looks like the authorities decided to allow several days of physical tributes, like placing flowers and notes at his childhood residence in Ahui but are now winding down those displays. The protocol for the management of Li's passing looks identical so far to that of former Premier Li Peng in 2019, though more people appear to have liked Li Keqiang. Premiers do not get the kind of memorial service that General Secretary Jiang Zemin got last year. It is likely a service for Li Keqiang will be held by the end of this week, The party has a playbook for these events, both for protocol and for managing the public, and they used it successfully less than a year ago when Jiang Zemin died. End quote. Commentators have observed that the death comes at a tricky time politically for Beijing, a time of uncertainty as they prepare for a critical plenary session of the top party officials in the coming weeks after the removal of China's defense and foreign ministers as state councillors. Quote, Judging by China's recent history, the sudden death of a top leader could be a catalyst for change. Days after Jiang Zemin died on November 30th, China lifted zero COVID restrictions. Rest in peace, Li Keqiang, a man with a broken heart. End quote. Next up, Beijing has kicked off its 10th Xiangshan Forum, Meetings where the military discussed topics of national and regional security. China's PLA-run outlet, China Military, described the event in a piece published yesterday, writing, quote, Under the theme of common security, lasting peace, the forum will closely focus on the security concerns of the international community, including hot security issues and key collaboration directions in the Global Security Initiative and will encourage parties to oppose contradictions and confrontations, boost trust and dissolve mistrust, and enhance exchanges, solidarity, and cooperation. End quote. Defense officials from over 90 countries, regions, and international organizations, as well as domestic and foreign experts and scholars, have attended the forum. Western commentators have observed that the two most common themes in the forum so far appear to be one, Taiwan, and two, blaming everything on the United States. On Monday, General Zhang Youxia, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, in a speech at the forum, expressed that the People's Liberation Army will, quote, show no mercy against any forces for Taiwan independence, end quote, adding, quote, no matter who wishes to separate Taiwan from China in any way, the Chinese military will never agree to it, end quote. The same day, Lieutenant General He Lei, former vice president of the Academy of Military Sciences of the People's Liberation Army, speaking to state-run Global Times, was even less ambiguous, expressing that, quote, Once the Chinese government is forced to use force in resolving the Taiwan question, it will be a war for reunification, a just and legitimate war, supported and participated in by the Chinese people, and a war to crush foreign interference, 
In this war, the People's Liberation Army will live up to the expectations and trust of the party and the people, fight bravely under united command, and achieve complete reunification of the motherland with the least casualties, minimal losses, and lowest cost, winning a great victory in the final battle of the People's Liberation Army's war and achieving complete national reunification. End quote. Adding, quote, the responsibility for provoking this war lies entirely with the Taiwan authorities, Taiwan independence, separatist forces, and external interfering forces. After the war, the Chinese government will bring these stubborn Taiwan independence separatist elements to justice and punish them severely. End quote. We thus note that Beijing's position on the Taiwan question is very much unambiguous. Sino-Russian talks were extensive too. Russia's Minister of Defense hailed what he called exemplary interstate relations between Russia and China with, quote, traditionally friendly relations maintaining high development dynamics and strengthening in all areas, end quote, and slammed the U.S. and its allies for, quote, inciting geopolitical tensions to maintain their one hegemony, end quote, and warned of the risk of direct conflict. Quote, what he is referring to is that the world is not at peace. The root cause is that the United States, in order to maintain its hegemony and its outdated and ossified order that it represents, is spreading its tentacles around the world and fueling up conflicts. End quote. Of course, this anti-American rhetoric is unsurprising. We see it in state media almost every day. But it is worth taking a moment to remind ourselves that in the highly nationalistic echo chamber of the People's Republic of China military specifically and the wider China information environment generally, it is likely that many in the People's Liberation Army, as well as senior officials, are not just placing all the blame for regional security concerns at the feet of the U.S. as a cynical rhetorical move, but actually, likely, deeply believe it. If so, this is significant and concerning as it greatly reduces the space to erect guardrails in military-to-military -military interactions at a time of great tensions between the two powers, and it also both increases the risk of an accident as well as reduces the space of de-escalation if such a military accident occurs. Next up, we discuss the Chinese economy and the four crises facing policymakers. Hi hey everyone, if you're getting some value from today's episode, liking, sharing, and subscribing are all big helps. It is just me making these videos every day, and I rely primarily on subscribers to keep the channel going, both financially as well as helping it grow. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are also in the description below. It's a true pleasure to make these every day for you guys, and I hope I can continue to do so. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Finally, in recent weeks, Martin Wolf chief economics commentator for the UK-based Financial Times, has published a series of widely shared opinion pieces on China's economic outlook. This series once again gives us an idea of how elites in the Anglophone world are debating this topic. Across the articles, Wolf argues that the picture is a nuanced and complex one, rejecting both the everything is bad as well as the everything will be okay views of China's economy. What he does do is discuss four factors which, if mismanaged, will pull down China's long-term economic prospects. We end today's video by examining some of the points made across these four opinion pieces, quoting selected excerpts from them directly. In his first article, called We Shouldn't Call Peak China Just Yet, Wolf writes that, yes, there are deep structural problems in the economy, but this is also a country with significant strengths. He argues that China has the potential for rapid growth because it is still poor. According to the IMF, China's GDP per head was only 96th of the world in 2022. Quote, huge attention is being paid right now to China's slowdown, its over-reliance on investment in property and its financial fragility. All this is understandable. But it might also be exaggerated. South Korea was hit by several big crises, notably the debt crisis of 1982 and the Asian financial crisis of 1997. 
Yet, in response to these shocks, Korea adjusted and powered onwards. End quote. The second opinion piece considers the biggest domestic economic problem, chronic excess savings absorbed in an unsustainable debt fueled real estate boom that is coming to an end. Quote, it looks as though the unbalanced economy is now being stopped by a mighty property crash. According to UBS, new property starts in July were 65% below their level in the second half of 2020. It also expects property sales and construction to stabilize at 50 to 60 percent of the peak reached in 2020 to 2021. Since the property sector accounts for about a quarter of China's economy, this suggests enduring weakness in demand and so something of a Japanese future. The danger is not one of a huge financial crisis, though. China is a creditor country, its debts are overwhelmingly in its own currency, and its government owns all the important banks. A policy of financial repression would work quite well. The danger is rather one of chronically weak demand. The basic reality of the Chinese economy is that household consumption is only around 40% of GDP. The investment rate is already spectacularly high, while growth is slowing. And still higher, non-property investment cannot be justified. End quote. As an aside, Professor Michael Pettis, who we often quote on the show, writing on this article from Wolf a month ago, expressed that, quote, This is the key point. Weak demand is at the heart of China's many economic problems. End quote. We continue now with Wolf. Quote, this looks like a decisive moment in China's modern economic history. If the government recognizes that the old high savings, high investment model is broken, it can generate responsible growth with a more balanced consumer-led economy. A savings rate of, say, 30 to 35 percent of GDP would be enough. But to reach anything like this, it must make revolutionary changes in income distribution and the priorities of government. This would be good for China. It can avoid the Japan trap. But will it? End quote. The third piece by Wolf considers the constraints imposed by a falling population. That is China's demographic crisis. He concludes that these are serious but manageable difficulties. Quote, what is clear is that with the population of working age forecast to shrink at an average rate of 0.8% from 2020 to 2050, 0.5 percentage points faster than the overall population, the risk in gross domestic product per head will be that much slower than that of GDP per worker, and GDP growth will be slower still. Nevertheless, if output per worker rises fast enough, growth in GDP per head could still be quite swift. Moreover, this is not at all impossible because productivity is so far below levels in countries closer to today's technological frontier. Yet, skeptics are right that this is not going to happen without a great deal of reform. Structural issues will have to be overcome." End quote. In these three opinion pieces, there is one unified theme. The political will and ability to overcome or at least mitigate economic constraints. This is what Wolf said in his first article, for example. Quote, the biggest question of all about the future of the Chinese economy concerns politics, both domestic and global. Domestically, does China have the leadership that wants to continue with rapid growth, or is it now inclined to view stability as more desirable? End quote. We remember that Adam Poson of the Peterson Institute of International Economics recently made the same argument, the bad king argument, as I called it at the time, sparking debate with Peking University's Professor Michael Pettis and others who argued that it's more about systemic or structural issues with the economy, which are to blame for the economic slowdown the country is now facing. Wolf discusses this role of politics in his most recent opinion piece, the fourth in the series on China's economic outlook, called Politics Poses the Biggest Threat to Economic Growth in China, arguing that abroad, Beijing must manage rising hostility, while at home, it wrestles with the relationship between communism and capitalism. Quote, this leaves us with the biggest constraint of all, which is politics. Abroad, China needs to navigate around the rising hostility of the US and its allies, 
At home, it needs to manage the shift to a more balanced economy to sustain the relationship between the communist state and the capitalist economy. These challenges are the most difficult the rising giant faces. If it fails to manage them, it could at least end up in conflict with the high-income democracies and at best be another country caught in the middle-income trap. Today, policy has become less predictable and more intrusive. Yet this is not the product of she's whims alone. The issue is far deeper. In the end, the party's marriage to the market economy risks undermining both its legitimacy and its control. She's desire to restore both inevitably undermines Deng's great achievement, which is China's economic dynamism. All this has become even more problematic now that the external environment is so challenging and the economy so much in need of rebalancing and reform. The biggest questions about China's economy the biggest questions about China's economic future are political. How will its relationship with the U.S. and its own governance evolve? A big domestic question is whether there will be the capacity to shift the economy away from its dependence on excessive and wasteful investment towards higher consumption and better investment. The still greater question is whether China has passed the point at which the relationship between the Communist Party and capitalism works. If not, which ends up on top. If as seems probable, it is the centralized party under the direction of one man. How can the market economy thrive? End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. I would be very interested to hear what your thoughts on these ideas unpacked by Wolf over these four articles are. Please let me know your observations in the comments section below. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Tuesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.